Well, it's Amanda and I are very happy to, to be here with you all this morning. Um, we first presented a couple years ago uh, at the Missouri Rural Health Conference on, on compliance, although a, a, a shorter presentation on compliance will definitely be going into some more detail this time around. And, and we also focused on EMTALA and behavioral health. And you know, two years ago, it was in person. Uh, you know, we had a great, great experience. Uh, two years ago, I never would have thought you know, last year's conference would be canceled for something like COVID or that we would still be, um, you know, doing things virtually. Um, but here we are and we will, we will, we will keep calm and compliance on uh, and, 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 and do the best we can. As Melissa mentioned, we'll look for a good time to take a break, you know, probably, you know, about an hour or so um, into our presentation. We'll try to find a, a, a spot where it makes the most, most sense. So Amanda and I are in different offices, so she's going to be the one controlling the, the slides slides today. It's a little bit easier when we're together and in person to, to control the slides. But to start with, I just want to talk to you all about what we're going to cover during this presentation. First, we're going to discuss why a culture of compliance is important. I think it's helpful if you're a compliance officer, if you're an administrator, it's always important to, to reflect on why compliance is important. But this discussion, this section of the presentation will also give you some helpful tools to utilize when you're trying to command, you know, convince board members or the governing body or you know, other members of the administrative team of you know, why compliance is important and why you're asking for resources to be invested in your compliance program. We'll then segue to discussing what is a compliance program, the seven elements of the Office for Inspector General's compliance program, and we'll work through each one of those. After we've given you a foundation with respect to those seven elements, we'll discuss uh, risk areas that Amanda and I have seen in our practice uh, in the last few years. These will be kind of our, our, our hot um, button uh, risk areas, and you'll as you'll expect, um, a little spoiler alert, COVID, <laughs> COVID is on that list. So you'll definitely want to stick around for later in the presentation uh, for our discussion with respect to COVID and, and, and the compliance issues that it has brought uh, to the healthcare sector. And then finally, we've got a long list of helpful resources from a compliance standpoint that you can use, you can take back to your facilities, uh, and your practices and, and hopefully will be a great uh, resource for you as you either you know, get your compliance program started if you don't have one in place or if you're dusting it off the shelf because it's just been in a notebook and you haven't really thought about compliance. These resources are really, really helpful and, 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 and are helpful for those that also have a robust compliance program. All right, so with that, thank you. So let's start with discussing you know, what is a culture of compliance and, and why is it important? So this, I find this message from the uh, from the U.S. federally federal sentencing guidelines to be you know, pretty key in understanding you know you know what a culture of compliance is, and and what those guidelines state that to have an effective compliance program, an organization must establish and maintain an organizational culture that encourages ethical conduct and has a commitment to compliance with the law, and and you really can't have a compliance program without those elements. So when we talk about compliance versus ethics, you know, what, what, do we, what do we mean? So you know, compliance is really the doing what is required, whether it's to, to follow the law, to follow the regulations, uh, you've got a specific policy or procedure on, a, on an item, or um, in your code of conduct, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Whereas with ethics, it's, you know, it may not, there may not be a law, there may not be a regulation, but you're, it, but it's doing what feels right. You know, what is right, you know, hey, carrying out things with integrity, um, practicing with integrity and, and living up to your organization's missions and values, even though they're, you know, to, to, to act otherwise might ne not necessarily be a violation of law. It would be a violation of your organization mission and your values. Now, I like this, this next slide, uh, to demonstrate the, the culture of compliance because it, it really shows all the different little pieces that have to come together for you to have, you have, to have a culture of compliance. 
you know, so often we focus on the laws and the regulations. You know, we get Amanda and I get questions all the time about you know HIPAA and EMTALA and the Stark Law and 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 information blocking and 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 all of the anti-kickback statute and all of these relate to laws and regulations. And that's, as you can see on this slide, is just one very small component of creating a culture of compliance. Granted, following the laws and regulations are key, but you also have all the, you have to have all these other pieces. You have to have, you know, ethical conduct. You have to have mission and values. You have to have integrity. Most importantly, probably, you need to have accountability and responsibility um, in, in order to hold those responsible to you know, carry out the mission, comply with the law, and, and you know, participate fully in the culture of compliance. You know, here's a, another slide that I find particularly helpful when I'm doing a presentation with maybe an administrative team or the governing body trying to emphasize you know why is the culture of compliance so important you know why are you you know why are you telling us that we need to invest in a compliance program administrator and and this slide could be something that would be helpful for you to utilize you know, you know number one we're trying to protect the organization you know, it, that's the foundation of any compliance program we want to have a compliance program in place so that we can protect the organization so that's prevention um, of you know violating laws and regulations. Um, that's also quick detection if we happen to be out of compliance. You know, if we're in a you know overpayment type situation where it was unintentional, you know, we thought our documentation had all the elements of the local coverage determination, or you know, we we yeah, you know, we didn't realize that we duplicate billed for a service. We want to have a process in place so that we can quickly detect those things, which again protects the organization. It minimizes the potential loss. It you know, reduces the likelihood that we're going to be involved in a government investigation. Preventing uh, uh, whistleblower claims is another piece of having a compliance culture in place. Uh, we'll talk about what this uh, key TAM actions are here in a minute. Uh, but I mean, essentially, it's 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 claims by folks that have most likely been internally in your organization at one point in time uh, to the, you know, filing a lawsuit or making a report to the government with respect to potential non-compliance. And then obviously you never want to be on the last little um, um, slide um, square here with respect to prosecution or sentencing. But as we'll talk about, Amanda, we'll get into more of that later. You know, one of the things that uh, that the government does look like look at in those criminal prosecution cases is whether you had a compliance program in place, and you know what exactly you know was it effective? Did it help identify the issue, or was it more of yeah we had one but it was just a binder on our shelf that we really hadn't fully implemented? The other piece that is I think a driver for having an effective culture of compliance in place is that it does help enhance your organization's reputation. You know, it helps when, 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 when the community, the workforce all understand that you have a culture of compliance and we're going to follow the laws and regulations and we're gonna follow our mission and values and we're gonna follow our ethics and integrity. That builds trust within your community, that builds trust within your workforce. And when you're all driving towards that common mission, that can really have a positive impact on your reputation. So I want to talk just a minute about uh, key TAM lawsuits. These are lawsuits that are brought under the False Claims Act, uh, and and under the False Claims Act, if you are a key TAM relator or a whistleblower, is how they're often returned to, then you can bring a lawsuit, and if you prevail, then you can are entitled to between fifteen percent and thirty percent of the recovery. Um, so, you know, a lot of times this and these types of claims arise around, you know, potential you know, billing, you know, not following uh, federally funded health care program billing guidelines. Somebody, you know, may report that by filing a lawsuit, a key TAM lawsuit. Then the government has an opportunity to decide whether they want to take over that lawsuit. And, you know, if the relator is successful, they get a portion of that, you know, 15 to 30 percent of that recovery. So if they determine that you, you know, overbilled for a particular service for six years and you, know, you got a million dollars, the key TAM relator is going to get a portion of that. Now, this last bullet, I really think is something that we want to stress and, and you should take to heart that 
as many as 90% of whistleblowers report internally first within their, when their organization. So they don't immediately pick up the call, you know, the phone and call the office of inspector general or call a lawyer or call a district attorney. They actually report internally to their organization first. And when their concern is ignored or they are retaliated against, that's when they look externally. And so this again demonstrates the importance of having a, an effective compliance program in place because you don't want these whistleblowers going externally. You want them reporting internally and, and that way that so you can address the concern. And sometimes you, you do your investigation and there's nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong, but you still want those concerns to be voiced internally. Uh, as opposed to externally, because it can be far more costly if they go outside the organization, uh, just not even just from a key TAM standpoint, but it could trigger a government investigation and you could be mired in that in years had you just listened to the person and done an internal investigation and either you know, impl you know determined that there wasn't an issue or implemented an appropriate uh, corrective action plan. The other piece of this, oh, go back just a second. I want to talk about the retaliation. It's, it's important that employees understand that there will be no retaliation, even if it turns out to be nothing, because I mean, some, you know, we don't know everything, and an employee may just have a glimpse of this, you know, this looks strange. Amanda and I get those calls and unfortunately emails, um, you know, detailing that, you know, you know, that, you know, we think we've got Medicare fraud because of, you know, A, B, and C. And you know, once you take a look at it and do some investigation, you realize, oh no, you know, that employee only, you know, only knew about one piece of it. They didn't know what we were doing over here. Uh, but you want to create that environment to make sure that folks feel safe making those reports, knowing that they won't be retaliated against, you know, especially if it turns out that, well, nope, you know, the billing was fine on that, or you know, the physician. Um, your relationship with the hospital, you know, that compensation was fair market value. You just want them to know that they won't be penalized. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Amanda. Money, money, money. Yeah, this, I think this slide speaks a lot about what the risk is for the healthcare industry. Uh, so fiscal year 2020 ended September 30, and the government had $2.2 billion in settlements and judgments. Now, this was down a little bit from prior years, in part, I think, because of the government's focus um, on COVID in 2020. But even, even if it's down you know, half a billion from prior years, look at when you look at what's attributable just to the healthcare industry, that's a huge portion of it. So 1.8 billion of that 2.2 billion is just related to healthcare, you know, healthcare industry. So fraud and abuse investigations, fraud and abuse litigation, you know, overpayments, those types of things, a huge portion of that is coming from the healthcare industry. And this doesn't, this figure doesn't even um, take into account criminal, potential um, criminal recovery. So this is really just your, you know, straight, Civil, you know, we've got an investigation, we enter into an, a settlement, or it's a civil, civil case, and a judgment was entered against um, against an individual or an entity. So, you know, this this slide illustrates that healthcare enforcement really is a money maker, very profitable for the government, and another reason for why we need to have compliance programs in place. I think I saw something the other day that. For every dollar they spend on healthcare, um, they receive eight dollars back in return, or something like that. I don't know if you've seen that figure, Brooke. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it continues to be very, very profitable for them. So, where do we start um, when we're when we're going to start thinking about dusting off our compliance program, or putting together a new one, or evaluating the current our current compliance program? And we do suggest starting kind of at the basics, which is the federal sentencing guidelines and some guidance from the DOJ. I think one of the very first slides we had was a quote from the federal sentencing guidelines. And, and it's really a starting point for your compliance program as it outlines some of the things that, that prosecutors will look at um, when they're evaluating the quality of your compliance program. 
The federal sentencing guidelines were put into place in 1991, and they've been revised a couple of times since then. But essentially, it controls the sentencing of organizations um, for the federal criminal violations. Chapter 8 of the federal sentencing guidelines is the specific chapter that looks at um, sentencing organizations and articulate some of the core principles um, that are, are considered when looking at someone's compliance program and the fact that you can get sentencing credit for effective programs um, that prevent and detect violations of law. So, so, these, so the sentencing guidelines helps give us a starting point for what are some of the core elements of an effective compliance program. Again, and this comes straight from the federal government, sentencing guidelines to have an effective compliance program, organizations shall use due diligence to prevent and detect, so not just detecting, but also preventing criminal conduct, um, and otherwise promote an organizational culture that encourages ethical conduct and a commitment to compliance with the law. So many of the things that, that Brooke talked about and in, in why a compliance program is important and, and creating this culture of compliance comes really straight from the sense federal sentencing guidelines in which they want to see a program in which you're preventing and detecting and encouraging ethical conduct and compliance. Again, under the federal sentencing guidelines, you can get credit. I mean, there may be a violation. We're not all perfect. Um, and so you can get credit for having an effective program, not just a program that sits on the shelf, but an effective program, um, provided that you meet several different types of criteria which if you look at these different criteria, it really is, is an effect, it shows that you have an effective program. So for example, the head of the compliance program reports directly to your governing authority or you, ha you have an appropriate reporting structure. Um, the compliance program discovers the problem before an outside organization um, discovers it. You're gonna get credit if you have an internal audit that identifies a problem or if you come to the government first, you're gonna get credit for that. Um, the organization needs to promptly report the problem to the government uh, in, in order to receive some of that credit. And, and, no, and here's the big one that we see a lot, I think is no one with, with operational responsibility essentially buried their head in the sand. You can't, you know, the ostrich is not the defense there. You can't just pretend it didn't happen or shove it in a box in the back corner. Um, your people with operational responsibility participated in, they were not willfully ignorant of the offense after learning about it. So while there's a lot of discussion in the federal sentencing guidelines and other compliance programs about the need for an effective compliance program, it's really silent on how you actually measure effectiveness. Um, there, there's a lot of emphasis um, on, on this, but, but they don't do a very good job of, of describing how it is effective. But essentially, they, they look at that the, the program must be fully implemented, adequately resourced, have an independent audit of, a, of the effectiveness, and effective broad oversight. So you're, and, and, and the other thing that we're seeing imposed a lot on, on new guidance is this increased push for outcomes and performance measures. So again, you're going to audit you're gonna learn from, from those audits. You're gonna learn from the things that you find out about um, or that are reported. You're gonna, gonna renew and update and, and you know, again, dust off the, the old compliance book and make sure that it is relevant for today's world. Hey Amanda, I have just one comment before you move on. I mean, I think part of the reason why the, the government is, is silent on how to measure the effectiveness is that it really isn't a one size fits all for providers they do seem to take an account and not hold, you know, a small rural hospital or a physician practice to the same level of compliance and implementation that they look to on a health system. And so that makes it difficult for them to say, well, if you do all of these things, you're going to, it, you know, it's going to be effective. Uh, so they do take some of that into account. And, and as we start to work through the seven elements, I'm sure there are going to be folks going, oh, my gosh, I'm a small hospital. I'm a small provider. Yeah, you know, you know, we can't do all of these things. And 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 we understand that Amanda and I understand that we work with small and large providers alike, health systems, physician practices, small hospitals. And so we know. And and so it, you know, really it comes down to is it fully implemented for a provider? 
or organization like yourself with, you know, based on the resources you have, you know, is it adequately resourced based on the types of resources that you can throw at compliance? Um, you know, do you have effective board oversight? And to me, the board oversight piece, I mean, that's the one that's probably should be the most common across all providers because that, I mean, that really is requiring the board to be active and know, you know, what's going on from a compliance standpoint within the organization. And one of the unifying themes, as Brooke mentioned, I mean, they want it to be reasonable and individualized assessment. And I think that came through immensely in some of the new DOJ guidance, and I shouldn't say new, it was about over a year ago, but but the, the DOJ guidance document that was originally issued in 2019 and then updated in June of last year, there was a pattern throughout the entire document that, that it should be an individualized um, assessment based on the provider. Um, and, and that's the reason why there really isn't a rigid formula, so to speak, but, but factors that you can consider or an analysis that they recommend the, the prosecutors walk through. Um, again, this DOJ guidance document is from the criminal division, but it's instructive from both the civil and, and, and criminal matter. Um, and, and the document is meant to assist essentially the government evaluators, they'd say prosecutor, but but I think anyone um, to make informed decisions on whether or not and to what extent corporations, their whether or not their compliance program was effective at the time of the offense and at the time of the charging decision. And so this guidance document articulates three, three questions, which are going to sound very familiar if you're paying attention to the last slide. Um, that 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 they want people to consider, which is, you know, what is your compliance program well well designed? Is that program being applied earnestly and in good faith? Um, in other words, are you is it implemented effectively? And does the organization's compliance program work in practice? Um, so it's going to look at, at essentially how it was designed. Are you operating under it? Is it working? Um, how how is that that compliance program operating? Um, and for each one of these questions, um, the document, the guidance document articulates different things that they want the prosecutors or people evaluating the compliance program to consider. And they want them to consider them both, again, at the time of the offense and at the time of the charging decision. So if you're going to, if, if you, if, if something happens and it's reported and you take action and responsibility and adopt, you know, adopt new policies and procedures, conduct training, they're going to look at the entire continuum of which that from the offense to reporting um, and how, how you responded essentially um, at, at, in, in evaluating all this information. And Amanda, before you move on to the factors, I just, I want to emphasize, you know, we, we, we are spending time this morning talking about the federal sentencing guidelines and, and, and you know, this uh, document uh, that was issued last June, and, and the focus is on the criminal side, but I, I do want um, the folks listening today to, to, to understand a couple things. First, a lot of times in a, in a criminal you know, healthcare fraud investigation, there's a civil component tracking along with it, and so you'll have, you know, you'll have criminal in the DOJ, you've got the civil with the, the Office of Inspector General, but they're talking, they're working the case together, and if you really can comply with the guidance from a criminal side, that's only going to help in the companion civil investigation, or even if it is just a civil investigation, having a well-designed compliance program is going to help you immensely and you know in a, in a civil investigation. You know, having it actually work again is going to be a positive. So, you know, even though this is coming from the criminal side and, you, and not every case turns into a criminal case. You know, having these pieces as part of your compliance program will help on the civil side as well. So one of the first things that they're going to look at is whether or not your compliance program was well designed. And it's going to look at several different risks or several different factors or consider several pieces. One of the primary ones being your, your company's risk assessment. They're going to consider that to be the starting point. Um, you know, how is that risk, how is that risk assessment of informed? your company's compliance program and how you set it up. So much like Brooke said earlier, you know, they're going to they aren't going to expect a small rural hospital or small clinic provider to have the same risk assessment as a large, 
multi-system, you know, health system. And, and so that, that risk assessment, the, the evaluator is going to use as the starting point for, for this, the size of your compliance program, the risk areas that you identify um, and, and the things that you find important because that is going to change from organization to organization. And, and essentially also that risk assessment, how it has evolved over time. Um, did you do it once when you created your compliance program 10 years ago and haven't done it again? Um, they're going to look at that, look at when that risk assessment was performed, how often it's been updated, how the updated risk assessment impacted changes to policies and procedures and, and, and use it as, as kind of your, almost your guidance document for your compliance program. And then, like I said, the, the risk assessment will, will somewhat dictate the different types of policies and procedures that you need to have implemented at your organization. Are they, are have they been updated? Have you been implementing new ones to address COVID or, or gender discrimination or any any of the new new emerging risk areas? Information um, blocking. Information <laughs> blocking, which we will talk about tomorrow. Um, you know, and then and then two, are they easily accessible? Can your employees find your policies and procedures? Um, I, you know, how often have I been on the phone with somebody and they're like, we have it. Surely we have a policy and procedure for that, but they can't, they can't find it. Are they easily searchable? Are they easily easy to find um, for people? Is your compliance program well designed because you conduct training regularly on it? They're going to look at your training schedules. They're going to look at whether you train people at, at when they start, whether you're doing it on an annual basis, whether you're doing consistent, you know, little compliance corner tidbits and emails. Um, they're gonna they're gonna look at how you implement those policies and procedures, um, and and how how you make sure that not only their the policies and procedures are easily accessible to your employees, but that they understand what is in them um, through those trainings. Um, the communication again, and, and you're gonna hear kind of an overarching theme I think today on on compliance kind of comes from the from both the top and the middle. I mean, the more you talk about compliance, the more you, you are open about, about compliance matters with your employees, the more you communicate that it's, it's, it's good to talk about compliance and report things that you're concerned about, the more you're going to see an effective compliance program. People aren't gonna cower in the corner every time they hear, see the compliance officer coming around the corner. Um, you, wanna, you wanna have those open, honest communications, both from your compliance officer, from your managers, from your board, um, and everyone. Then also an effective reporting and inv investigation process. Um, they're going to be looking at that, which which hopefully that's worked well on um, when they're evaluating it. But but having a process for which you can you know, employees can make the report that the report is listened to, that you investigate it. It's not just written off because it's a small little thing. And and again, the employee doesn't have the whole story. And you know that the employee doesn't have the full story, but you just don't investigate it. You don't put together that investigation report. Um, the third-party management, they're going to look at how you how your rationale for needing a third party, whether you evaluated the risks in having those third-party managements um, and, and the effective communication with them. Um, and then mergers and acquisitions, um, they're going to look at if you have a timely process for, for integration or orderly integration of, of a merger or acquisition. Um, and and to to loop them into your existing compliance program or effectively merge those two compliance programs um, when you do merge or, or or acquire another healthcare provider um, wherever that might be and and make sure that there's an and that a compliance reporting structure um, and program structure is is seamless in that transition. The next thing is, is they're going to look at whether it was adequately resourced or empowered to function. This section in the 2019 document was previously called effectively implemented, and I'm decided the DOJ gets paid by the word when they're going to update this many words into something that is, is looking at effectively um, implemented. But, but the reason for the change and the, the addition of words is, is, I think, a good one because they wanted to make it clear that you've got your compliance program has to be adequately resourced for it to, to operate. It needs, there needs to be commitment and buy-in. There needs to be resources for them to conduct audits. There needs to be access to, to programs um, for them to, to make sure that it, it's not just a bunch of policies and procedures and, and 
uh, reporting structure that sits on you know sits on the shelf. Um, it, it it is resourced. It functions. Um, there's a buy-in from the management, all levels of management um, and employees, um, and and that everybody understands it. There's varying levels of disciplinary measures. You know, if something minimal happens, maybe education is the best. If it's a flagrant repeated conduct by a particular individual, there's termination involved, um, and and that you kind of have this this the the ability to to resource and 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 function as, as an operate effectively um, is what they're gonna be looking at at the second one. And then the last one is whether or not it works in practice. Um, did it, does your program identify issues? Is there, are you looking for continuous improvement? Um, are you evaluating it? Are you periodically testing and auditing and reviewing your compliance program? Are you testing your individuals or, or giving them those little snippets? Not everybody likes to sit on a monthly or semi-annual basis in a compliance program where we sit there and we lecture you. Um, so are there fun ways that you can look into implementing compliance into, um, into your program? Um, I, I was reading an article about how they have almost like a Game of Thrones type um, competition um, about whether or not people know about compliance matters. And so there's some fun ways you can go in, into whether or not making sure that your employees know and have that periodic testing and review um, of your compliance program. When there's misconduct, you investigate it. Again, how often does somebody come and they come, they do a compliance concern and, and either they don't have the whole story or it's a minimal thing and, and you just kind of write it off in the back um, and, and, the, and don't do the investigation. Um, and then your analysis and remediation, there's more, there's been a higher emphasis on making sure if something happens or if you identify new risk areas, you, you look into them, you remediate them, you, you update your policies and procedures, you, you take steps to, to, to respond and remediate and update and, and move forward. So now that we've explained a lot, what is a compliance program? What does it look like? Well, I think as, as the DOJ guidance documents and the federal sentencing guidelines discuss, they want a program that utilizes tools to be proactive, not reactive. They want it to prevent and detect violations um, and not just simply respond to them. You want people stepping up and mentioning something seems a little off at the very beginning because it's much easier to respond to when it's the itty bitty little nugget than when it's this massive monster hiding in the closet. Yeah. Um, I'd add just one thing to that point. I mean, in, in, you know, Amanda and I help clients with investigations. I mean, despite having an effective compliance program in place, things happen. We're human. Uh, people make mistakes. And if I had a nickel for every time I had somebody that I was interviewing as you know, part of an investigation, you know, they were identified by the client as somebody that might have information. And I sit down with them and they and you know, one of the first things they say to me is, I'm not surprised that you're here to talk to me. Well, that's I mean, that's sending off alarm bells to me. I mean, I much I mean, like, why did you wait to say something? Why did you wait for there to be investigation? Why did you wait for the lawyer to come and talk to you? Um, and, and, and to me, that you know, it demonstrates, uh, well, this is we have a flaw in the compliance program because this is somebody that isn't surprised that we have an issue in our billing department or with our implant vendor, but didn't understand that she or he should speak up and say, you know, something just seems funny about this, that something doesn't smell right. Or you have the alternative of, well, I said something a couple of different times, but you know, somebody told me I didn't say it, say it to the right, I didn't call into the hotline or I didn't, you know, fill out this particular report, but I did say something a couple of times. And you're, I know my heart rate always spikes whenever I hear that. Cause I'm like, well, oh dear. Um, we, we have, have a whistleblower, potential whistleblower. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so again, your compliance program should aid in protecting your entity from the risk of improper conduct. That doesn't mean that improper conduct isn't going to happen. It should just be one of the, a, it should be a tool in, in, in protecting you from that improper conduct. So um, several years ago, I think was it CMS or somebody came along with these seven fundamental elements of an effective compliance program. 
Um, OIG office. Oh, OIG, that's it. That's it. Yep. OIG, HHS OIG um, came out with that, and and um, th they came up with these seven elements, which are going to sound very similar to the things that we talked about from from the federal sentencing guidelines and from that DOJ guidance document. Your policies and procedures. You've got compliance professionals. You have effective training and effective communication as part of your compliance program. Your risk assessment and your internal monitoring. You know, did you use, do a risk assessment and then just let it sit on the shelf and you didn't continue to monitor and update? Um, enforcement of the standards. Are you are you interviewing people? Are you you know if somebody continues to violate your code of conduct, are you taking disciplinary action against them? Are you rewarding people for being good at following the code of conduct? It doesn't always have to be a punishment. Um, you can have you know, rewards for people doing the right thing. Um, and are you promptly responding when something happens or a report occurs? Um, are, are you promptly and, and adequately responding? So we're gonna walk you through all seven of these um, as you consider your compliance program and different aspects that we feel are important for each, each one. And I'm going to dive right into policies and procedures because, again, this this is every policy and procedure um, for every organization is going to be slightly different. They're going to be unique to to your organization. They're going to address the issues that are important to your orga organization. And again, a smaller facility is probably not going to have this massive four you know three ring binder. Uh, you know, stack of policies and procedures. Um, your yours might be a little bit more basic, but but you're still going to need to have those policies and procedures that outline how people operate. Um, we have the code of conduct up here on this slide, but but the code of conduct really is a cross reference or refers to the policies and procedures that you implement. You're going to have a policy procedure for for HIPAA, um, MTALA, standards of care, um, fraud and abuse. Dealing with other and dealing with um, with individuals, um, patient relationships, um, business relationships, the needs for for business associate agreements. Um, you're you're going to have a bunch of policies and procedures, and you want to review those on a relatively regular basis to to make sure that they're up to date and they're user friendly. Are you using a bunch of terminology that just simply isn't used anymore in our profession because you haven't updated them since 2010? Um, now, in some cases, that just may be the way the law is. I mean, um, how often do I hear people complain that HIPAA hasn't been updated in, in a very long time? But, but are your policies and procedures updated? Are they outlined in plain English? Can they understand them? Um, the recommended language level or reading level for policies and procedures is is 10th grade um and and that so that way it can encompass your entire employee base um and has your senior leadership endorsed and, and approved those different policies and procedures but the policies and procedures should be should outline how your business operates and what your expectations are for those for the various different compliance areas non-discrimination um, would be another one. And then your code of conduct is, is the document that's going to set the standard for, for promoting compliance and following those policies and procedures. Um, it's going to talk about following patient care and treatment. Um, again, the legal aspects that, that, that you have to deal with. Um, record retention. Are, are your records being properly retained? Particularly now that, that a lot of things are electronic and we're not just going, all right, here's a box of medical records or here's a box of, of billing records, stop a, you know, slap the, the date they get destroyed on it and put them in the salt mines. Um, you know, are you following the proper record retention for your for for emails um, or or any type of electronic data? Um, and and your business relationships. Um, are you looking at how gifts are coming in the door and um, and whether there's an improper inducement um, related to those different business relationships and reminding employees too of their of potential conflicts of interest. Um, those code of conducts, the policies and procedures, those should be provided to all employees when they start. Um, and then consistent renewal or updating of them should be a condition of their continued employment. Um, and the failure to follow policies and procedures 
should result in disciplinary action. Um, again, these are these are the methods by which you operate, the, the standards of which you expect your employees to conduct themselves. And if they fail to do that, there should be some sort of discipline. Again, the discipline doesn't have to be termination immediately. It can be maybe education because you haven't gone over the policy and procedure with them in a year and a half. Um, but but looking at how the failure to abide impacts how your how your company operates. I mean, I just uh, I just had a couple thoughts on the code of conduct. And going back to what you said, you know, policies and procedures you will vary depending upon the type of provider, the size of provider, and you know, the specialty of the provider. But everybody, I don't, you know, whether you're a long-term care facility, a, you know, a critical access hospital, a large health system, home health, hospice, whatever, everybody should have a code of conduct, um, regardless of the provider type. And, and going back to what you said, Amanda, I mean, it really is what's the cornerstone of the compliance program and, and the organization conveying to their workforce that compliance is important. Uh, it's a, you know, a great way a lot of providers you know, have a statement and they're about their mission values and how compliance and integrity and you know, providing you know, top-notch service to the community is, is, is the mission. Uh, and, and, and employees workforce, you're expected to carry out the mission. It also, as you've illustrated on the slide, gives a little bit of a description of you know, some of the key areas related to compliance and the expectations with respect to patient care and some of the illegal issues and the business relationships. Uh, but those are all more fully developed in, in policies and procedures. So those folks, you know, for example, in the records department who really need to understand HIPAA, high tech authorizations, patient access, they're going to get more additional specialized training on those specific HIPAA policies, um, whereas somebody that is in food service or uh, you know, janitorial service may not need to know the ins and outs of HIPAA. But everybody, you know, regardless of job type, whether you, you know, dietary, janitorial, nurse, physician, administrator, CEO, board man member, should have access to the code of conduct and, and, and be educated on what the expectations are. Both the code and conduct and the policies and procedures need to be reviewed regularly and updated regularly. Um, and, and you're probably going to hear us say update, review, update, review, probably, I don't know, a million times in this in this particular presentation. Um, but again, I, I think it's, I, I, we both, Brooke and I have dealt with a lot of different providers that, that come to us in the middle of a government audit or something and they hand us over the policies and procedures or, or code of conduct and, and the last date on it is 2008. Um, and our world has changed a lot since then. Um, and so again, not that you have to change it every time you review it, but, but regular review and updating is, is, is a sign of a good compliance program. Um, Again, simple, short, um, or the, the code of conduct, I think, and this leads into a little bit of what Brooke was discussing. The code of conduct is often simple, short, and separate from your policies and procedures. While it's going to talk about your policies and procedures and talk about those expectations, it's going to be simple and short. Don't just copy and paste. Don't duplicate your policies and procedures into your code of conduct. Um, that's not, one, it's overly burdensome. Nobody wants to read that um, because they've already read, hopefully already read the policies and procedures. But you know that short, distinct highlights. Here's the takeaways from a particular policies and procedures. Here's what you, as a dietary individual, need to know about record retention. Um, um, is is what your code of conduct should look like. And then two, when you're when you're when you're training on your policies and procedures, when you're looking at your code of conduct, when you're educating your employees, use real life examples. That is the easiest way for your employee base to relate to what they expect of you or what you expect of them. Um, using those real life examples, the things that have happened, we'll give you a couple of examples here today, uh, it really can help drive home that, that you know, what, what the expectations are, how things, I mean, how mistakes happen, how the compliance program um, can be effectively implemented and operated. And the more, the more of those real life examples you can use, the easier it's going to be for your employees to understand what is expected of them. All right, element number two uh, of the seven elements we're going to cover this morning. 
Uh, I'm going to cover the role of the compliance officer, compliance committee, and, and compliance reporting structures on, and how the, the compliance reporting should flow within your organization. So compliance officer, uh, something that's necessary to have a compliance program and is one of the elements that you need to have somebody that's a, it's a, it's a compliance officer. Um, that person may wear multiple hats, uh, but they need to, to they need to also be focused on compliance. What the Office of Inspector General uh, recommends as part of its guidance is that the compliance officer needs to have direct access to the board and senior management. And, and, and that is what their expectation is because I think they've, there've been investigations, there have been issues where, yes, we had a compliance officer, but the compliance officer essentially had no authority. They couldn't, they couldn't report to senior management. They couldn't report to the board. They're essentially a figurehead within the organization without any real authority to, to make changes or to respond to potential compliance issues. So it's important that your compliance officer knows that they can talk to senior management, they can report to the board, you know, they can go to you know quarterly, do a quarterly report to the board, do an annual report to the board, um, so that they have that direct contact. The OIG also recommends that the compliance officer not serve as the rule of CF, as CFO or general counsel. So where possible, uh, you know, obviously given the size of your organization, sometimes it's not possible. Maybe the CFO is the only person that could serve in that role. Uh, but if you can find somebody else, HR administrator, you know, practice administrator, um, to, to serve in that role as opposed to using the CFO, that would be uh, the you know the more the best practice per the OIG guidance. Um, another component, and if and then this is something that we see in larger organizations, larger physician practices and hospitals, is that you actually have a compliance committee. And, and when you're large enough and have the resources to do that, this can be really um, great from a compliance standpoint, especially if you uh, take the cross section like we recommend. Uh, you know, Amanda and I have dealt with clients before and it, you know, their compliance committee consists of all the physician owners of the practice. Or you, you know, or you have a hospital that just you know, just has the risk manager and the HIPAA person and you know physician on the risk you know, on the compliance committee, and that's not really helpful from a compliance standpoint because we've got issues coming from you know we, it's not just clinical it's not just physicians we've got them coming from all different angles and so it's really helpful to have a cross section of organizations so you have somebody um, from operations you have somebody from finance. Uh, you have somebody from HR. A lot of compliance issues, you're they're you know commingled with HR type issues. They may be leading to a termination. They may be leading to a sanction. And so it's it's important to have that HR uh, coding clinical folks uh, because we have a lot of investigations, compliance uh, issues that come from those sides. And sometimes it might make sense to have legal uh, involved on your compliance committee. Uh, and maybe it's just more of a um, ad hoc by invitation only, but that could be inside or outside counsel that would participate. So here, are these next couple of slides, I'm going to demonstrate the, the typical compliance reporting structure. So this is what I would characterize a reporting structure for a larger organization that has the ability to have the compliance committee. Uh, so you know, the compliance committee is, is tasked with assisting the compliance officer in carrying out uh, compliance within the organization. So that could be assisting with investigations, that could be assisting with doing that policy review and update that Amanda, Amanda entered earlier. You know, that could be helping uh, with training. Um, and, and the information recommendations would flow through the compliance officer to senior management and the govern, governing body. In a smaller um, um, organization where you just don't have the resources or the manpower to have a compliance committee, it could just be the compliance officer. And as I alluded to before, the compliance officer may wear multiple hats. You may not have a designated person as a compliance officer. Your compliance officer might be your director of human resources. Your, your compliance officer might be the administrator of the practice or the executive director. And, and that's okay. I mean, it's okay for the, the compliance officer to wear multiple hats. It, it's just important for the compliance officer to remember, you know, which hat he or she is wearing at any given time when they're dealing with certain issues. So it's like, am I, am I a director of HR right now or am I the compliance officer? Because that can um, impact how you approach an issue. But again, the, the flow would still be the same with respect to the reporting that the compliance officer is reporting to the senior management team and also the governing body. So here, 
it's, I guess, would be our recommendations when you're thinking about doing reporting, and especially when you're reporting up the chain to senior management and to the governing body. So, you know, you know, the important thing is you've got to establish goals from a from a your your organization's compliance strategy standpoint. I mean, you know, what are you trying to accomplish with your compliance program? Uh, and that, I mean, that will differ depending on the organization. Uh, if you've just come off a you know significant and government investigation into documentation and medical necessity, then you're definitely going to have an out, different outlook on compliance program and what your strategy is, as opposed to somebody that's brand new practice or you know brand new trying to roll out a compliance program. But it's important to be able to establish those goals and and articulate and communicate those out because you can't. There are so many things from a healthcare regulatory standpoint coming at you. You can't tackle them all. I mean, you've got to have certain goals. They've you know, they've got to be reasonable so that you can achieve them and then move on to the next. And that's kind of the next point, the measuring prospect, oh, re- measuring pro- progress, that's a standpoint, um, that you've got to have a way to see, you know, once you establish the goals, you start working the goals, you know, how do we measure progress? Uh, is it a certain number of uh, education training uh, at a year for our workforce members? Is it a certain number of compliance hotline calls? Uh, is it reducing the number of payer audits uh, and questions that we get on medical necessity? So you as an organization have to determine what that is and then measure that progress. And then ultimately, you've got to report the results. And, and that reporting is key for senior management and, govern, and, the, and the governing body. Uh, you know, and, 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 and coming up with a way, maybe through dashboards where you can do a quick snapshot of, you know, this is where we're at. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, we've got 95% on doing our education training uh, annual compliance. Um, you know, we still got 5% of our you know, workforce that needs to complete it, those types of things. All right, you can go on to the next one. So again, kind of thinking about how this works from a reporting standpoint, you have the compliance committee slash compliance officer, you're working together, they're developing the risk assessment and the work plan. And, and as part of developing that risk assessment, doing that risk assessment and developing that work plan is that you have to you know, weigh the business risk you know, against kind of the benefits. So you know, what is the cost, you know, patient safety, quality, regulatory risks, and, and weigh all of that against, against you know, you know, what it's actually going to cost. Of course, there's, there's dollars, but there's also administrative time in trying to uh, roll this stuff out. And then, you know, as you're reporting this to senior management and governing body, you know, what you're really asking them to do is to provide the buy-in approval uh, so that the, you know, working the risk assessment, working the work plan can be successful within the organization. This slide discusses uh, kind of the ways I handed to a couple slides ago with respect to tracking your accomplishments. Board members, Senior management, they do not have time to review 20 page reports going, you know, line by line, uh, compliance by compliance related issue. They need something where they get the gist of what's going on from a compliance standpoint within the organization in a but in a format condensed that they can, you know, they can read it quickly and understand, okay, this is what we have going on. So I've provided some examples here on the screen of you know ways to create dashboards. Uh, and again, this goes back to your goals and what you're trying to accomplish, but uh, you know, if it's if you've been uh, you, a potential goal would be if you've struggled to get compliance investigations closed within a timely um, period of time, you know, maybe that's you're tracking the number of days on average it takes to get a, com- a compliance investigation closed. Um, you know, maybe you're concerned about contracting within your organization and that there may be uh, different departments entering into contracts with physicians that you don't know about, that have not gone through legal review, which creates all kinds of potential anti-kickback, stark law, healthcare regulatory risks. And, and so maybe you're gonna you know, implement a policy that all of those need to go through legal, which of course Amanda and I would recommend. Uh, and, and, but you're tracking those that may be still slipping through the cracks despite that, that re-education. Um, compliance training uh, is huge and something that is very easy to track. And then the number of hotline calls, um, you, you may be, uh, you didn't have a well-publicized hotline number and you've decided to post the hotline 
uh, all around the hospital, in work rooms, and 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 need to try to increase the staff knowledge that that is a resource for them to use. So maybe you decide to start tracking since we posted the poster, you know, before that on average, we get five a week. Now we're getting 15. Those are the types of things that you can put into a dashboard uh, to demonstrate relatively quickly what you've accomplished from a compliance standpoint. Compliance officer, you know, we recommend that the compliance officer, you know, in addition to doing the dashboard, and for a lot of our clients, their boards are meeting monthly or you know, every other month. And so there is a compliance you know, section on the agenda. Um, but at a minimum, you should have the compliance officer reporting quarterly and you know, providing updates. And that again, doesn't have to be a written report. Uh, you don't, you know, you don't want them to get lost in the details. But it needs to at least be on the board agenda compliance where the compliance officer is provided an opportunity to say, you know, this is where we're at. And, and maybe it's we've successfully got everybody through training. We successfully closed out our last payer investigation, whatever it might be. But just so that the compliance officer is making some quarterly reporting to the senior uh, management um, and the governing body. All right, effective training. I think as we mentioned earlier, and this is element number three, that, I mean, one of the, sometimes the most common or heartburning um, issue that I will hear is, well, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know if it was an issue. I didn't know who to report it to. I didn't know what was going on. Um, and a lot of that boils down to making sure that you have effective training. Um, and 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 that, that relay that this is important to us. Um, you tend to not train on things that, you aren't, you know, that are not important to your to your entity. Um, and so again, training, training needs to be part of the onboarding process, um, outlining that code of conduct, outlining the policies and procedures that are important to that individual's job description and expectations. Um, and, and that includes not just your employees, but also your independent contractors. If you have people coming into the facility, um, whether that be a, a man, device manufacturer or or um, your 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 physicians or anything along those lines, the people that come into your facility interact with your with your patients, interact with your employees, all need to have some component of training as part of their orientation process to your facility. Now again, that's going to vary based on what they're due and what their jobs are, but that some sort of training, and maybe it's just going over the code of conduct. Here are the expectations while you're in our facility. Um, it needs to be part of that onboarding process. And then regular reviewing and updating that training with the individuals. I mean, if you if you audited your employees right now, how often would they say they're getting trained on compliance matters? Um, was it just at onboarding or are they seeing it as on a regular basis? Um, we recommend that you, you do that training and review and update at least annually, if not more often than that. Um, because again, it can be so burdensome to sit down with your entire employee base and make sure that everybody gets additional training, you know, over an in-service weekend or something. It should be something that is just regularly part of, of your culture there. Um, and so one way to do that is to reinforce compliance throughout, throughout the entire year. It can be the a compliance corner part of an email newsletter. Um, it can be just in your staff in-service meetings. All right, everybody, and here's your here's your compliance tidbit for the day. Um, as a reminder, Jane Smith is our compliance officer. If you have any questions, go to her. Um, little reinforcing tidbits throughout the entire year really brings to the forefront for employees and everyone that compliance is important. We take it. We we take it. Very, I mean, it, it, it's important to our, our 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 processes. We take it seriously, and we we want to listen to you when you have concerns. Um, when you do that training, and particularly if it's in in person or virtual or part of part of a staff meeting, make sure you're documenting attendance. So you can see who's been there, who is who has gone to those those particular training sessions, and then two. Don't forget to train your governing body and senior management. I think as, as Brooke was talking through some of those reporting structures, you know, on your quarterly report or whenever your compliance officer comes to your, your governing body meeting, if there's, you know, if there's no audit or anything pending, don't, I mean, part of the compliance officer's report could be training your governing body um, on, on compliance matters or reminding them, giving them a compliance corner tidbits um, and making sure that that every single individual 
has training on the compliance program um, and no one is above that, that particular training because that also helps you get buy-in from all levels. The last thing you wanna hear is, well, we employees have to sit through this all the time and the governing body never gets to hear it. No, they, everybody, everybody gets trained, everybody sees it, everybody understands what the obligations are, everybody knows what the expectations are. Um, part of the training should be testing, testing knowledge. Um, do they remember what they've been told or did they sit there in the training session glossy eyed the entire time and can't even recite what was said or the name of the name of the training? Um, it, it should the, the training, the knowledge, the testing should be one component of their job, um, part of their job position, understanding their compliance aspects. Um, and and two, you know, when 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 you get this from the from the from the top down, all the managers, everybody, um, and, and you're constantly training on it, you're constantly talking about it, employees are more likely to believe that the organization encourages them to speak up, which is which is a culture you want to promote. Um, again, I think I said this earlier, you don't want people to cower when the compliance officer comes around the corner because they're afraid they're gonna notice something's being done wrong. Um, you want to have that constant education, networking, compliance officer on site, visible, um, talking to staff, talking to people. Um, so they're not they're not someone to be afraid of. And and to to make sure that everyone understands the reason for the compliance program is to constantly do the right thing. This goes probably back to your mission statement, your code of conduct, the idea that that doing the right thing is very important to your to your company and your organization. Um, and that when you're constantly talking about it, you're constantly training on it, you're constantly reinforcing your code of ethics or, or professional ethical conduct, everyone's going to start to review compliance as their responsibility, as part of their job description, um, and, and as part of holding everyone accountable um, in, within the organization for, for the operation and running of, of a good compliance organization. Some things to include in your general compliance organization are just, again, um, the elements of the compliance program, the, the policies and procedures, the training, the reporting, the auditing, the ethics um, aspects of it. Your, your code of conduct is, is one of the best things to, to be part of your education system. Again, the reporting system, I know I've sat down in interviews with employees going, we didn't know who to report to. We thought it was wrong. We felt it was wrong, but we didn't know who to take it to. And we we didn't, you know, weren't sure, and and it's not it's not an easy thing for people to report. Um, it, there, there's a lot of a lot of of confidence that has to come into reporting. So understanding that reporting system, individual accountability for for reporting the suspected noncompliance, um, making sure that everybody again feels responsible for ensuring the compliance program operates. Um, part of all this also gets into reinforcement that there's a non-retaliation policy. People are afraid to come forward because they're afraid they're going to get fired or punished. Um, and, and you want to promote and reward people and, and emphasize, no, we are not going to punish you for coming forward. Um, you have a job and responsibility to, to report your concerns and we will take them seriously. Um, again, asking people who the compliance officer is. A lot of people don't know, especially in smaller organizations where the compliance officer wears a bunch of different hats. They may see the CFO as solely the CFO because that's how that's the hat they walk around walk around in the most. Um, and so making sure that everyone understands that. Um, and then a couple of the final things too are really just going back over policies and procedures. Why is this important? Why, why are the ethics important? Why is privacy important? Um, and a lot of that gets into recent enforcement actions. I mean, we're seeing and we'll get into this. Um, a little bit later in the presentation, but I mean, from a privacy standpoint, you're seeing 19 right of access um, enforcement actions from from um, regarding you know the HIPAA right of access, and so making sure that they understand why these things are important right now, because again, using real life examples is going to help them understand why the company is emphasizing this. So again, you might also want to incorporate specific training for certain individuals. Uh, you might want to sit all of your LPNs down and say, here's what's in your scope of practice. Please don't do things that are outside of your scope of practice, um, as I've been dealing with a couple of, of, of those recently. Um, your your payer reimbursement principles. What kind of documentation do you need to have in the record to make sure you get reimbursed for, for providing that service? Um, how often have Brooke and I seen 
sorry, we're not paying that because there's no documentation for it. But if you went to the employees or the people providing the services, did they know that part of the reimbursement required documentation of wound drainage or whatever it happens to be? Um, if you're dealing with somebody that might have a lot of, of, of buy-in to the third, different third-party relationships at the facility, they might need specific training on how those third-party relationships need to be structured, what type of provisions need to be in any type of agreement, um, what agreements need to be in place before a third party provides services. Um, privacy breach, we're seeing a lot of privacy um, breach issues right now, cybersecurity issues. Um, so we'll, you know that, that type of, of training might be more specific for others. Um, and so you wanna give some thought, and, and this is just kind of a bullet point list of some of the things you might wanna think about that are important for not everybody, because it may not be important for um, your LPNs to be trained on Stark and anti-kickback laws, but looking at the different components of your organization, the different employees, the different job descriptions, and what specific training may they need in addition to your general training so that they understand expectations, the laws, and how to ethically operate. Um, one of the biggest tips that we can we continue to give and see is, is, you know, managers and supervisors, you may not be the compliance officer, but your employees are often going to be the most comfortable coming to you um, to, to report um, suspicions or concerns. And, and that when they report to you, that is a report. Um, and so it, you shouldn't discourage them from coming to you and bringing concerns um, to you. And so these are some of our tips for managers and supervisors when staff bring compliance and concerns to you. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned, you're gonna be the preferred person. They're the, you're the person, if you're a manager or supervisor, you're the person they see on a daily basis. You're the person they interact with. You're the person they probably have some sort of personal relationship with. Um, and so reporting is very sensitive, very concerning um, um, for individuals. And, and so it may feel like a massive issue to them and they're gonna feel the most comfortable coming to someone that they're comfortable with. Um, and be open to that. Um, be open to being the person that your, your, your staff come to to report concerns. Um, acknowledge when they do come to you that speaking up is hard. Um, it, thank them for speaking up. Thank them for bringing the concern to, to you um, because it might be small for the organization, but it is certainly significant enough for them if they wanted to bring it to your attention. Um, listen to them. Don't brush them off. Don't say, well, that, that's, it's okay. I, you know, Somebody else is handling it. Listen to them, tell, tell them you're taking the concern seriously and, that, and gather information from them. Um, the more information you can gather, well, keeping in mind you're not the person that should be investigating, but, but listening to their concern, the information that they have, um, the more they will feel like there's an open and honest communication structure. Um, engaging, then, then once, once they report, once you get as much information as, as you can and feel comfortable with, make sure that you do engage the appropriate organization functions to conduct the investigation. Maybe that's going to the compliance officer. Maybe that's going to legal counsel um, or whoever it might be. But but keep in mind, unless if your job hat is investigation person in the compliance reporting structure, you you may not be the best person to investigate into that particular complaint or concern. And then at the end of the day, make sure you're closing the loop with that employee. Make sure that you are 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 communicating to them that that the concern has been taken care of seriously. It is being investigated. You may not be able to tell them the results of the investigation or the outcome or where it is in the investigation, but letting the employee know, we took your concern seriously, we're looking into it, we've closed the investigation, things have happened. Um, we'll let them know that, that, that they are valued, that their report was valued, um, and that the compliance program is, is truly important to, to, to the organization. Okay, man.